So, Colby, Aaron, before we start, President Biden gave his State of the Union address Thursday night, and it got me thinking about this idea of reflecting on things. So at its core, a chance to assess the situation. If I were to ask you, what is the state of your union? Well, given I just had to restore sanity to my studio after my kids tore down all the blankets and the pillows in this small closet from which I record. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty par for course for me. I, I can't complain too much, but uh, it'd be nice if they stayed out of my studio. <laughs> it's daddy's work for it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the state of my union is hectic. We have a new puppy, so the puppy wakes up multiple times during the night, so it's like having a newborn. But I also have a small child as well, and so the house is just loud and crazy all the time. I can't wait to hear who will be giving the rebuttal speeches to both of your states of the union. (laughs) (laughs) Before we go any further, I'm Elahe Asadi. It's Friday, March 8th, and this is The Campaign Moment. It's our new Friday politics chat here on Post Reports. As usual, I am joined by senior political reporter Aaron Blake. Aaron, hello. Good morning. And Aaron also writes the Campaign Moment newsletter. And today we also have Colby Ickowitz, who is a national politics reporter covering campaigns for The Post. Hi, guys. Colby, what would you call out as your campaign moment this week if you had to pick one? Yeah. And the thing that I'm the most interested in this week is where the Nikki Haley voters go Mm. in November. It's something I've been thinking about since I was in New Hampshire and attended some of her events. And so that's what's been on my mind. That's also been on my mind. So we'll definitely be digging into that later. And Aaron, what is your campaign moment this week? Yeah, it is that State of the Union address. We had the solidification of the general election matchup after Super Tuesday this week. And that meant that the State of the Union following two days later really kind of set the tone. And I think we saw a real preview of the kind of campaign that President Biden at least intends to run in the next eight months. Yeah, that's actually where I would love to start our conversation today about the State of the Union. This was a rare opportunity to see President Biden speak for a long time. It was nationally televised, and it comes in the backdrop of all these questions about his cognitive health. And I don't know, was I the only one who tuned in to watch this almost like, it's almost like the feeling when you're watching the Olympics and a gymnast on the balance beam, and you're like, are they going to stick the landing? Yeah, I think that is, you know, the Biden campaign is building this age issue up as some kind of a media construct. And that it's something that we're creating as a narrative. This is something that Americans were very concerned about long before this kind of became a a focal point of our coverage. It's something that lots of Democrats are very concerned about. There was a New York Times Siena College poll this week that showed 60 percent of Biden 2020 backers think that he's too old. A quarter of them think that he is basically too old to effectively serve at all. So this is something that looms and having a lengthy speech in which there was some jousting with Republicans was really a key moment because I think it sets the tone and it it gives people a picture of Biden that they don't see very much because he doesn't do a lot of interviews. He -hmm. doesn't, you know, volley with reporters very often. Yeah, Colby, I don't know if you felt this way, too, but it it kind of struck me I, almost I, you know, I have a familiarity with stand up comedy and it almost felt like he was like doing crowd work, dealing with hecklers, like a really energetic stand up comic almost at times. I think Democrats who have been kind of holding their breath for the last several months breathed a major sigh of relief last night watching the president. He looked like he was having fun. He was animated. To your point, he was like jostling with the crowd You know, when they booed him, he had quippy comebacks right away. It did not look like a man who was having cognitive issues, a man who was too old to serve. You know, people joked, like, whatever he was on last night, give me some of that, please. Because, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was exhausted watching this. I was really struck by how much energy he had and how little energy I had. (laughs) Right, totally. And I think that's an important point that Colby made. Look, uh, you know, before this, it's like, you know, it's a scripted speech. Mm -hmm. He can practice this a lot. He can, they can refine it and make it as, you know, a a good speech. And he can read that speech and he can, you know, inflect and do the things that you need to to give an effective speech. The real question moving forward is, you know, as far as kind of demonstrating that vibrancy, it is in answering questions. It is in interacting with Republicans, potentially at a debate one day. 
So I think when he went off script in uh, on the immigration issue, which I'm guessing we're going to get to, and on, on issues like that, and he kind of gave it as good as he got, Yeah, that was important because those are moments that not only get lots of attention in the news coverage because they're, you know, unusual and interesting, but they also showed that he's not this, like, totally, you know, out of it guy who can't, you know, have a conversation with people, which is kind of the caricature that we see on Fox News a lot. Yeah. Well, let's hear some of that. This was a moment, like you said, it was off script. He was talking about an immigration bill that was moving through Congress before it stopped moving through Congress. And yeah, he moved off script. So let's listen to that moment. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is... Yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know... I know you know how to read. <laughs> like, when I heard the, I know you know how to read, I mean, that that was like a mic drop moment, sort of. Yeah, and and this is a moment that Republicans kind of walked into Mm. from the start, you know, by entering into these negotiations to combine border security with Ukraine aid, coming up with a deal that Biden is right. A large number, a significant number of very prominent Republicans said this was a very good deal and that they needed to do it now because this deal wouldn't be around again, even when Trump is president. And so he has those things that he can point to and say, look, the border patrol union is on board. The Chamber of Commerce is on board. This is something that would have secured the border. And then Republicans walked away from it. And I think that, you know, this was kind of the thing that Republicans walked into a few months ago when they walked away from this bill. And he really drove home that they kind of didn't come to the table on this issue. Yeah. And to Aaron's point about the immigration issue, I mean, this was going to be one of the Democrats' biggest Achilles heels was going to be the border. And what the Republicans did a couple months ago by walking away from this bipartisan deal was really give Democrats a huge gift because Biden can now say Democrats can now say, look, we were ready. We were ready to secure the border. We were going to put more resources down there. But you said no. Donald Trump said no. And so it's going to be a lot harder to kind of stick the border crisis attacks on Democrats now coming into November. Yeah. Just to just to add to Colby's point, this all happened so quickly when they were negotiating this deal that a lot of Americans did not process the details of this immigration deal. The early Mm. polling showed that people were just not familiar with it. So having a moment like this that kind of injects this discussion more earnestly into the campaign, I think, was helpful because it it allowed him to make a point that a lot of people probably didn't process in real time. Yeah, in some ways, I'm looking at how the State of the Union address went, both in what Biden said and how he was able to manage the crowd and the response is giving us a preview of the of looking ahead to the rest of the campaign. So were there any other policy moments beyond immigration and that exchange that stood out to you both? And what does that tell us about how the Biden campaign and Republicans are going to handle these issues going forward? I thought it was really interesting that he started with Ukraine at the very top of the speech. Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. Obviously, this is a really current issue in Congress with the the House deciding what to do with a Senate bill that would provide $60 billion, got 70 votes in the Senate, including 22 Republicans. So it makes sense to start with that from that standpoint. But I also think that if you look at the entirety of the speech, a lot of what Biden was trying to do is highlight issues that divide the Republican Party like Ukraine does point to the things that Republicans aren't doing that have widespread support in the American public. So there's, you know, half of Republicans are holding up Ukraine aid and half the party doesn't want to fund Ukraine. But 60 percent of Americans want us to at least continue what we're doing right now as far as helping Ukraine. And, And we saw this on other issues like IVF, you know, immigration to some extent, abortion rights. 
he kept pointing to these things that, you know, would seem to be kind of more or less consensus issues to some degree in Amer- in American politics and kind of challenging Republicans to respond to them in, in certain ways. And I thought it was really interesting on a, on a lot of these he kind of got a little bit of agreement from Mike Johnson, the House Speaker, who was sit- seated behind him, some kind of yeah. gentle clapping and nodding. Oh, my gosh, uh, the while... body language experts <laughs> swooping in to say, what does this nod mean? Yeah, there we go, yeah. But, you know, while Johnson was doing that, every other Republican basically in the chamber was kind of sitting on their hands and not wanting to play into what Biden was saying. So I think mm-hmm. that really kind of highlighted the dilemma that Republicans are in on a lot of these issues, and Biden tried to force those issues. And I was really listening for what he was going to say about reproductive rights and IVF after the Alabama ruling. Democrats have really wanted Biden to go harder on that issue. They think it's an issue that allowed them to overperform in the 2022 midterms when there was supposed to be this red wave and Democrats Mm -hmm. did way better than anyone had expected. And a large part of that was due to the fact that Roe had been overturned. And so the president didn't actually use the word abortion in his speech last night. He, this is a word that he is uncomfortable with, but he did talk about reproductive rights. Those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <laughs> And I think that was like a really strong message from the president to say, listen, these guys, my predecessor, these Republicans want to take away your rights. Even something like IVF, which is supported by a vast, vast majority of the American population, whether you're conservative or liberal, you know people who have gone through IVF. Maybe you've had IVF yourself. It's never been a controversial medical procedure. And so... The president really hammering home on on those issues, I think, made a lot of Democrats really happy last night. Yeah, Colby, you bring up an interesting point, too, about how often he said the word my predecessor. I think it was clocked in around a dozen, maybe 13 times. And we actually have a montage of him saying my predecessor. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president, tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. But my predecessor and many in this chamber want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. My predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Yeah, I mean, it just felt like this is the opening of the campaign season, that this was a campaign speech. And he even had Democrats in the in the chamber chanting four more years, four more years. I mean, how unusual was this compared to other State of the Unions you both have covered? And and yeah, is this the start of the campaign season, basically? It, it was more of a campaign speech than you usually see in a State of the Union address. They tend to be more campaign oriented once you get closer to the actual campaign. I also thought it was interesting, you know, this is a President Biden very early in his tenure was reluctant to invoke Trump. I think he wanted to kind of do his own thing and not be defined by what had come before him necessarily, he tried to turn the page on things. But as with Trump, you know, in the Republican Party, you know, there's always kind of this belief that this is going to go away and they won't have to deal with it anymore. And then it's just still here. And so I think this was a, a reflection of Biden kind of acknowledging that he needs to take this fight and use it every forum that he can. I also thought it was really interesting the number of times he invoked not just Trump, but also the Republicans in Congress. He he was speaking to them directly and kind of challenging them to get on board on these issues. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, the speech that was taking on the Republican presidential frontrunner and and presumptive nominee. He was also going after Republicans in in a very political speech. And I think you're going to hear a lot of the lines from last night repeated on the campaign trail. To Aaron's point, this was a political speech. Some State of the Unions can be pretty dry, really policy focused. This one was he was hitting all those major points that you're going to expect him and the campaign to make when he takes this fight to Trump, which basically started this week. You mentioned that earlier, Elahe, that, you know, with Nikki Haley out of the race, this is now Biden versus Trump. This is the this is the election that we have. And this was Biden's chance to tell the American people this is what's at stake. 
Yeah. I guess the question going forward, at least for me, will be in some ways, like not to take it back to the stand up comedy analogy, but it's Biden's playing his home club, the Congress. I mean, he's been in, in Congress for so many years. He's comfortable there. So once he gets on the campaign trail or once there's a debate, that's what I'm going to be looking to to see if if this is going to translate in the same way in those spaces. Yeah. And, and the fact that he stuck around for I think it was like an hour afterwards and just kind oh, of gosh. glad handed with the members of Congress. Like, yeah. The, the, yeah. This is his happy place. I, I think being in the in the chamber of Congress is probably happier for him than being in the White House. He was a senator for a very long time before he became vice president and then president. So I think we also need to take that into account that this is a forum that probably plays to his strengths more than a lot of other forums do. And I think that Biden backers really want to believe that this kind of changed the game as far as people's concerns about Biden going away magically all at once. Mm. I doubt it's going to be that. I think he probably moved the ball in the right direction, though. And you have to imagine that once he's on the campaign trail, he's going to deal with more than just Republican hecklers. He's going to deal with protesters. He's going to deal particularly around the issue of what's happening in Gaza. He's going to have people at his events kind of yelling at him and calling him Genocide Joe. And like, how does he respond to those attacks? He can get really defensive sometimes. You see that sometimes when he's uh, sparring with reporters. He doesn't do it often. But when he does, that's what I'll be looking for as he kind of gets out on the campaign trail. Like, okay, it's one thing to throw a, a jab back at the Republicans in the chamber. It's another thing to kind of take on voters who are unhappy with you. And so were there any other moments that really stood out to both of you? I mean, It's kind of like a theatrical thing watching the State of the Union. You have Supreme Court justices there. You have the entire cabinet. Like you said, Aaron Biden was on the floor of the House forever. Afterwards, it kind of reminded me of trying to leave a family gathering. It takes forever to say goodbye. I thought it was really interesting that he he called out the justices. To their faces. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following. And with all due respect, justices. Women are not without electoral electoral power. Uh, Excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about that. You know, the idea of a president calling out the Supreme Court and saying, you guys decided something wrong and that's why women voted uh, for my party. Like, that's that's a novel and, and relatively new thing in our politics. And I think it kind of just reinforced how political, you know, even events like this have gotten. And this is just maybe a a sillier moment, but also illustrates the fact that these events have become much more political and less somber than they used to be, was uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene wearing her red Make America Great Again hat onto the chamber floor. And the the facial expression of Joe Biden when he saw her, it'll be a meme forever, I think. It's just a look (laughs) of, I don't don't know, how would you describe it? Like bewilderment? Yeah, it was like almost like he knew he was going to be memed for this face. (laughs) Right, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) And And by the way, hats are not allowed on the House floor. So I don't know. They, I don't know what they're going to do about this, but it was there was a lot of talk beforehand about how Marjorie Taylor Greene was breaking this House rule, and then she was just wearing the hat the entire session. So, you know, on the list of political norms that have been bulldozed over the last <laughs> eight years or so, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure this ranks terribly high, but also kind of a, a small example. Also, selfies. I've been around long enough to remember when you could not take photos on the chamber floor, and they just had to kind of like ignore that rule after cell phones because now everyone is on the floor taking selfies. Selfies right. of themselves during the State of the Union. That used to be frowned upon. Yeah. I mean, that really surprised me because I'm like, if you had that much time with the president, wouldn't you want to just say something rather than, but hey, you got to do it for the gram, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> The other question I have is how have Republicans been responding to this performance by Joe Biden? And I'm also thinking about the Republicans' response by Senator Katie Britt. The most thankless job in politics is delivering the State of the Union response. You know, Katie Britt is a rising star in the party and pretty much liked by everybody in the Senate Republican conference. But it was awkward. The Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland, spying on our military installations, and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. It was a very dramatic presentation. There was lots of whispering and smiling while you're whispering. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, It conquers America. And what does President Biden do? 
you know, I, I don't want to overplay this because it is such a difficult thing to do to speak into a camera with everybody watching like that. We've seen over and over again people be ridiculed for delivering right. weird responses. I'm thinking like of Bobby Jindal. Rubio. Yeah, Marco <laughs> Rubio with the water, the sip yeah. of water, the getting the dry mouth. Bobby Jindal is one that maybe people have forgotten about, but he drew a lot of comparisons to Kenneth the Page from 30 Rock. Uh, might be my <laughs> oh, favorite example of this. So let's not read too much into this, but like, you know, the idea that the message really penetrated too much is probably didn't. Well, and the other big person to think about how they're responding is Donald Trump. How is he responding to this speech? You know, you saw Trump on his Truth Social, you know, try to make it seem like Biden is is the one who's, you know, super divisive. He said something like this was the angriest, least compassionate and worst State of the Union ever made. It was an embarrassment to our country. And so that, too, is go- giving you a little hint into the tone of the general election that both of these men are going to be going hard on character attacks and kind of hitting each other as the one who's who's dividing our country. All right, let's take a pause there. And after the break, I want to dig into Super Tuesday and some down ballot takeaways. We'll be right back. And we're back. This is the campaign moment. Joining me is Aaron Blake and Colby Ikowitz. And I want to ask you both about Super Tuesday. Obviously, the big news was that Nikki Haley bowed out of the race. There were also some surprises. Uh, Nikki Haley won Vermont. That wasn't expected. But also Joe Biden lost American Samoa. <laughs> uh, to a businessman named Jason Palmer from Baltimore. His thing was he assured voters that he's, quote, actually very well known on the mainland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he's from Baltimore. It's not that far away from D.C., but somehow I'd never heard of him, even though he's a he's a local. I, I, I you know. I think the fact that we're talking about these two results kind of shows how <laughs> uncompetitive the nominating contests have been. Mm. You know, Vermont was notable because Nikki Haley actually won a state. She added that to winning the D.C. primary over the weekend. And it actually, you know, gave her a little bit of a parting gift at the very least. I'm not sure you can transfer the politics of Vermont onto many other states or even parts of states because it's such an unusual state. And then the American Samoa result was just fascinating because this was less than 100 people who showed up to these caucuses, <laughs> a population of 45,000. So it's a very small territory to begin with. And then less than 100 people showed up and gave this man 51 votes that provide him three delegates to the Democratic National Convention. So uh, Jason Palmer now has as many delegates as Vivek Ramaswamy and almost as much as Jeb Bush won in the 2016 presidential campaign. That's just okay, for that's, 50, that's, 51 people, 51 yeah, people. That's pretty wild. So my big question is now that Haley is out, where do those Nikki Haley voters go? Which, Colby, that was your campaign moment. So what have you been hearing? What have you been seeing and reporting on? So I spent a little time in New Hampshire before the New Hampshire primary. And what I was struck by, I went to a few Nikki Haley events and a lot of the Nikki Haley supporters in the room were were Biden voters. They were people that had voted for Biden in 2020 and were reluctant to vote for him again. But they were also never Trumpers. And so I think, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, will Republicans come home to Trump? I think you'll be surprised how many Nikki Haley voters are actually going to turn and vote for Joe Biden because they just can't bring themselves to vote for Donald Trump. They've been never Trumpers. It's why they voted for Biden in 2020. And and maybe they think Biden's too old. Maybe they wish they had another choice. They really liked Nikki Haley. She's young. She brings diversity to the party, but they don't have that option now. And so their options are between Trump and Biden. And I also I saw a poll and Aaron is a is like a poll whisperer. So he can tell me if this was a poll I was allowed to look at. But I think it was an Emerson poll that said that 63 percent of her supporters would go to Biden and 27 percent to Trump. And so if you look around the country at, you know, what did she win? 30 to 40 percent of the vote in a lot of these primaries. That's a pretty large chunk of people who would now go and potentially vote for Biden in the general. Yeah. And, that, and the, the big question is, Colby mentioned how these are 
a lot of people who voted for Biden in 2020. Biden would prefer that these were not people that voted for him in 2020. He wants, you know, Republican base voters to be the ones who have turned out for Nikki Haley and won't vote for Donald Trump in November. And so, you know, we have a limited amount of data on like who these people actually are, how many of them are kind of Democratic leaning, who decided to vote in a Republican primary because the Democratic contest isn't really at all competitive. And I think there's a significant chunk of them who, you know, weren't really on the table for Trump to begin with. But if even a very small portion of these Nikki Haley voters, and a lot of them in these exit polls say that they're not sold on voting for Trump in November, the one in five of the voters in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina who voted in the Republican contest said that they would not vote for Trump in November. If it's one fourth of that, that's a very you know significant thing and could potentially weigh significantly on the result in November. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and Colby, I mean— I'm curious to ask you, looking forward, you know, as you cover Pennsylvania very closely, you follow Pennsylvania politics very closely, and that state is going to be really important come November. I'm not sure if there were any other trends or down-ballot races from Super Tuesday that you were noticing that you think will have an impact in a place like Pennsylvania. Were there any other races around the country that stood out to you or that we should be looking to next? I mean, Pennsylvania— and Michigan are both going to be like ground zero in November. Whoever wins those two states is probably taking the presidency. And I was actually just in Pennsylvania, to your point. I can't, it's Pennsylvania is just a state I can't quit. And so I just <laughs> keep going back. So I was there last week and talking to voters specifically about the IVF issue. But a lot of women, suburban women, the type of voters that you need to turn out to win a swing district are very upset still about the kind of threats to reproductive freedoms, especially now this IVF ruling in Alabama. And even though Republicans have been really quick to kind of clarify, like, no, 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 we still support IVF, suburban women are still feeling like, I don't know, am I, I is it safe to vote for, for Republicans, for conservatives, if this is what could happen? And so I think that you're going to find a lot of suburban women coming out like they did in 22 in places like Pennsylvania, in the Philadelphia suburbs, and supporting Biden because they're motivated by that issue specifically. And you look at like the last, you know, two years since Roe was overturned and all the ballot initiatives that have passed or have been rejected around banning abortion. This is an issue that really matters to people. People were shocked when when Roe was overturned and they want to protect those rights. Yeah. And are there any other takeaways from Super Tuesday in some of these other states and these down ballot races that tell us something about where the politics of the moment are right now? And I'm thinking especially about the fissures within the Democratic Party and and where progressives stand and can a more left and progressive platform really prevail in a general election? The two that I would point to, one was actually not on Super Tuesday, but you know, we've had this uncommitted campaign the, in Michigan primary. Right. They, you know, Rashida Tlaib, the congresswoman, and and a bunch of Democrats kind of told people to vote uncommitted against Biden. They got 13 percent in Michigan. It was kind of like a, well, what does this really mean result? But then on Super Tuesday, it got 19 percent in Minnesota. The day after, it got, I believe, 26 percent in the Hawaii caucuses. This is getting some significant traction, especially in the Midwest, it seems. There are, of course, questions about whether these people would actually sit out in November or not vote for Biden or vote for Trump. But it seems like this is growing as a protest vote. And we've seen the White House respond by, you know, in the the State of the Union, Biden was talking about humanitarian aid, building a port in Gaza to deliver that humanitarian aid. It does seem like the message is getting through to some degree to the White House and they're adjusting their behavior to some degree. And I think that's really significant. This is a very troubling issue for Biden, not just because of those uncommitted votes, but because this is an issue that divides his party roughly in half. And there are all kinds of very passionate people on both sides of that. We've seen that over and over again, the the protesters blocking the motorcade route to the State of the Union address on Thursday night. And so, you know, I think people can kind of downplay this, the uncommitted votes, but this isn't a very real issue. And we keep seeing that that over and over again. Mm -hmm. What I think is really interesting about that issue is that immediately after October 7th, you had members of the so-called squad, Cori Bush, Summer Lee, Jamal Bowman, get primary opponents from the center, you know, more pro-Israel Democrats running against them because of their anti-Israel 
rhetoric in, in the days and weeks after. But the public opinion on this has shifted considerably since then. And so I'm specifically, I've been watching very, very closely what's going to happen in Jamal Bowman's district, which is like Westchester County and a little bit of the Bronx. In New York. In New York, right. Mm-hmm. And so he has this challenger who's very, very popular county executive in Westchester, very pro-Israel. Jamal Bowman has been unapologetically been calling out genocide since the early, early days of this war. There's a lot of strong Jewish population in that district, but there's also like a strong progressive and uh, minority population, too. So what happens in that primary, which is at the end of June, I think is going to tell us a lot Hmm. about where the Democratic Party is on this issue. Yeah, that's super fascinating. The last thing I wanted to ask about is this idea of Trump amnesia. I've been thinking a lot about this and the idea being that a lot of voters have sort of forgotten what it was like having Donald Trump in the White House because so much time has passed. But I also wonder if part of it, too, is because he's not president anymore. He's not getting the same sort of mainstream media coverage that he used to get as president. And Especially after January 6th, it felt like there was a big push to, you know, not carry his statements live, be very careful about what is being aired. And I just wonder if a lot of Americans who aren't like so plugged into like the conservative eco media ecosystem are just not so exposed to his rhetoric right now, his platform and just the way he carries himself, let alone like what it was like to have him as president. Is this a real phenomenon? Like what do we know about the historical context of this? Does this normally happen to former presidents? Yeah, you know, whether it's amnesia or something else, it is clear that views of Trump have improved when he's been out of office. And this is a very normal historical occurrence. If you look at former presidents, they are often significantly more popular after leaving office. Uh, George W. Bush left office with like a 30 percent approval rating. The, The Iraq war and Hurricane Katrina really, you know, damaged him at the very end of his presidency. And now he's like, a guy that six in 10 Americans actually like right now. Yeah, who paints. Um, and he, because he paints, yes, and he yeah. stays out of the political fray. Right. Trump's numbers have not improved as much as a normal president, but they have improved. There was a CBS News YouGov poll over the weekend that showed 46% of Americans said that he did an excellent or good job as president. His approval rating was very rarely above the low 40s when he was actually in office. Hmm. There was also a, the same Monmouth University poll showed Only four in 10 Americans disapproved of how Trump had handled COVID. At the end of his presidency, that was six in 10. So these are things that people, because they're not paying attention closely, can forget about, but they can also be reminded about them. And I think that's what Biden said about doing in the State of the Union was saying, look, January 6th was a pretty bad thing. Maybe we should remember that and do something about it. Maybe we should, you know, this should be an issue in this election. And I think it's clear that, At least right now, these issues are just not dogging Trump as much as they did when he was actually president. I told you that Aaron was a poll whisperer. Yes. (laughs) I will be having Aaron on speed dial every time I see a new poll drop. Aaron, what does this mean? Tell me what it meant four years ago. Uh, Gladly. I'll have all the numbers prepared for you and ready to go. (laughs) Great. Thank you. Thank you for doing the analysis. Well, that's it for today's episode. Colby, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. And Aaron, again, thank you as always. Thank you. And everybody remember to subscribe to the Campaign Moment newsletter. That's right. You can find a link to the Campaign Moment newsletter in our show notes. We'll we'll have a link there and be sure to subscribe. Colby Ikowitz is a national politics reporter focusing on campaigns for The Post. And Aaron Blake is a senior political reporter. And he is the author of the Campaign Moment newsletter. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced and mixed by Ted Muldoon. It was edited by Renita Jablonski. Our team also includes Maggie Penman, Rena Flores, Lucy Perkins, Monica Campbell, Alana Gordon, Ariel Plotnick, Bishop San, Renny Svernovsky, Sabi Robinson, Emma Talkoff, Sean Carter, Peter Bresnan, Allison Michaels, and Martine Powers. I'm Elahe Izadi. We'll be back on Monday with more stories from The Washington Post.